Our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Carrie Cornier from the University of Alberta. Carrie's talk is entitled Overview of Evidence on Cancer Outcomes Related to Physical Activity. Carrie. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me here today for this uh, exceptional workshop that I'm, I'm very keen and interested in. Uh, like Pam, my talk is going to be restricted to just looking at the cancer outcomes. Other talks will focus on the broader health outcomes. And I'm going to come at it from a similar perspective as Pam, except uh, looking at the research on physical activity. I'll start by reviewing a, a recent systematic review that's looked at the association between physical activity and cancer outcomes, talk a little bit about the biological mechanisms, but then also introduce this concept of precision medicine approach and how it might be useful for understanding the link between physical activity and cancer. Uh, talk about the current limitations of research and, and why these are probably, um, um, you know, reducing the chances of getting this research into practice because of the limitations uh, of the research so far. I'll share with you some ongoing studies that we're, we're involved with and others are involved with, trying to get more definitive answers uh, on the role of physical activity and cancer outcomes, and then end with some summary and conclusions. So this is a recent systematic review led by my colleague Christine Friedenreich. Uh, uh, Up-to-date literature search looking at 26 studies where they had a measure of post-diagnosis physical activity and then followed um, the survivors for cancer outcomes. I think the novel aspect of this uh, systematic review is also this precision medicine approach to try and review the literature to see if these associations vary not just by the type of cancer but by molecular or genetic markers related to those specific types of cancers. So 26 studies overall, I think about 20 or 21 of them had a measure of cancer specific mortality and that's what the focus of this slide is. But overall you can see a very consistent and strong association. Those survivors who report the highest level of physical activity compared to the lowest level of physical activity have about a 37% lower risk of dying from cancer during follow-up. Remarkably consistent across uh, breast, uh, colorectal, and prostate cancer. Now there's many mechanisms for this effect and this is why I always enjoy following Pam's talk because she does a fantastic job sorting out those mechanisms and many of the mechanisms uh, for physical activity are very similar to the ones that are proposed for the obesity link. So the, the insulin IGF is a big part of the explanation, uh, different proteins involved in DNA damage, uh, certainly uh, hormones uh, are involved, immune system, inflammation, and so on. So there's many mechanisms that have been looked at. These have been looked at within animal studies and also human studies, with the majority of research showing that exercise has effects on these mechanisms that would be consistent with a lower risk of dying from cancer. So this is a, a model or a figure that we proposed in that systematic review acknowledging some of these uh, mechanisms but I put it up here more um, for this side of the model raising the issue of precision medicine. This idea that we can look at patient subgroups uh, and determine whether or not the association might differ. And we've looked at things like um, ER status and breast cancer, HER2, uh, various colon cancer markers, and even some prostate cancer markers. And the idea is that um, there could be a protective association between exercise and survival. We would call these kind of exercise responsive cancers. But there could also be no association, uh, or even worse, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And we would refer to these as exercise resistant cancers. So I'll give you an example from Jeff Meyerhart's uh, work who's been looking at the association between physical activity and colorectal cancer outcomes, but also looking at it by various molecular markers. So this is um, lo looking at the link between physical activity and cancer-specific mortality by these various markers. And, and he does the, the test for interaction uh, on these markers as well. But you can see in this example, and again, there, there's other published papers, there's an interaction with P27 expression. For those, uh, I think it might be just colon, colon cancer tumors that express 
uh, uh, P27, there's a substantially lower risk of dying from that cancer for the most active patients compared to the least active patients, suggesting that this precision medicine approach could be fairly helpful. Now, you can note a slight increase in risk for those who have lost it, now, lost that particular uh, tumor expression. Not significant, obviously a very wide confidence interval. But I raise it just that we need to be open to the fact of the possibility there could actually be some cancer types that are exacerbated by exercise. We saw this in Pam's presentation where in some uh, cancers, obesity might be protective. Not sure whether it's causal or not, but the association is there. And we, see that we may see that in some of these uh, uh, cancers related to physical activity. In fact, there is some animal research. Most of it shows positive effects on tumor growth, metastasome, but there's a small number of studies that show that exercise makes the uh, tumors grow faster in animals. There's some studies showing that makes the tumors greater metastatic potential. So even though we're all very supportive and keen on the lifestyle uh, um, interventions, we have to be open to the possibility that something like a vigorous exercise uh, intervention program for some cancer types may uh, worsen outcomes. I don't see any of that yet, but as we get more and more into this precision medicine approach, certainly there's the possibility. And, and that, of course, is very important information for cancer patients to have. So this research has many limitations. For some people, uh, uh, the main criticism is that there's no randomized trials and they don't need any further criticisms after that because that's the definitive criticism. And this is why, uh, like Pam, I very much support us moving towards these randomized trials and I'll share those with you in a moment. But even looking at it just as observational studies, there's many limitations. In fact, none of these observational studies have been designed to look at physical activity and cancer outcomes. They were never designed for that purpose. So it leads to all sorts of limitations. Uh, they don't have physical activity or fitness as the primary exposure of interest, which means oftentimes they don't have a really good measure of physical activity. Uh, oftentimes no measure of sedentary behavior, which many of you will know is also uh, an important um, uh, potential exposure linking uh, to cancer outcomes. No objective measures of physical activity or sedentary behavior. No objective fitness assessments, which could really inform the types of exercise interventions we might want to do to improve cancer outcomes. Limited biomarker data, and few are really designed as even cancer survivor cohorts. So they're oftentimes randomized trials that are then followed up because they have a physical activity measure, or they're a healthy cohort study that is just parlayed into a cancer survivor cohort as people uh, get diagnosed with cancer. But what this means is you have variable and arbitrary follow-up assessment. Sometimes the first assessment is two months after their cancer, sometimes it's three years after their cancer because they weren't designed really as a cancer survivor cohort. And then oftentimes limited disease and treatment data, which is profoundly important when you're trying to look at cancer outcomes to be able to adjust for important disease and, and treatment factors. And very few cancer survivor groups have been examined. So I'll share with you a few studies um, that have been recently completed or are ongoing and give you some updates. Um, data from our START trial in breast cancer patients, our ongoing AMBER cohort study in breast, the CHALLENGE trial in colon cancer patients, and more recently the INTERVAL or GAP4 trial in prostate cancer patients. This was our um, supervised trial of aerobic versus resistance training, our START trial, where the original intent was to compare aerobic exercise to uh, strength exercise to usual care in breast cancer patients who were receiving chemotherapy. And the focus was really on quality of life outcomes, symptom management, fitness related outcomes as well. Um, and we randomized 242 breast cancer patients in this particular trial. But well, we decided we should follow them up for long-term outcomes to see what might the impact might be. Much to our pleasant surprise, we actually found that uh, eight-year follow-up, the disease-free survival was 82.7% in the exercise groups, those who did the aerobic or the strength exercise, versus 75.6% in the usual care group. So a 7% absolute difference in disease-free survival eight years later for those women who exercised during their chemotherapy versus those who didn't exercise during their chemotherapy. 
The hazard ratio is 0 0.68. Uh, you can see the confidence intervals, though, exceed one, um, meaning that it's not a reliable finding, and we're not sure, in fact, that that's a, a positive effect. Um, in part, we only had 242 breast cancer patients in this study. However, it is the first randomized controlled trial data suggesting that if you exercise during breast cancer chemotherapy, you can potentially improve breast cancer outcomes eight years later. We did look at some subgroups, even though we're grossly underpowered to, to look at these um, subgroups. But uh, I think the key thing is the findings are actually quite consistent with the observational data. You can see the effects of exercise are stronger in the women who are overweight and obese, stronger for those with a little more advanced cancer, stage 2, stage 3, and stronger for those who are, had ER positive cancer. So some of the um, kind of precision medicine, molecular approach suggesting that uh, um, even in randomized control trial data, these are the subgroups that might benefit the most. We have an ongoing um, cohort study, which to our knowledge is the first one that's really prospectively designed to answer this question, uh, looking at the, the link between physical activity, fitness, and breast cancer outcomes. We call it the uh, AMBER cohort study focused in Alberta, and it's being done along with my colleague Christine Friedenreich. We've recently published a description uh, of the first 500 participants who are in that particular study. Basic idea of this study is we recruit them at the time of diagnosis, um, and we get some blood uh, uh, sample from them, ideally before surgery in some of them, and some of them after surgery. And then we try and do this comprehensive battery of tests prior to any initiation of adjuvant chemotherapy, so soon after diagnosis both clinical assessments as well as patient reported outcomes. We do it again at um, one year, we do it again at three years, and then at five years we're just doing the patient reported uh, outcomes, and then following them for the long-term breast cancer outcomes. So the whole study is built around the idea of focusing on physical activity and fitness and how it might be linked to breast cancer outcomes. So what, the, what that means is that the key strength of this study is these measures that we have related to physical activity and fitness. They do comprehensive self-reports of physical activity and sedentary behavior. We, they wear two accelerometers, one an accelerometer, one an inclinometer, to look at physical activity and sedentary behavior. They wear that for a week before they start adjuvant treatment, a week at one year, and a week at three years. So we'll have objective data on the patterns of, of physical activity that they engage in. Uh, we do try and get maximal cardiorespiratory fitness testing on all patients. Those who are unable or unwilling, we get submaximal fitness testing on, maximal strength and endurance, and even for body composition, we have DEXA scans, and that's a very important um, uh, measure. Most of the studies that Pam would have reviewed would all have been based on BMI, sometimes measured, sometimes self-reported, but not really getting at the body composition of the role of fat mass versus lean body mass and linking that to potential breast cancer outcomes. We now have over a thousand breast cancer patients on this study. We have uh, uh, quite a good follow-up at one year and, and good follow-up at three year. We hope to complete accrual by uh, the end of next year and uh, follow up five years after that. So it's still going to be a few years yet before we have actual data from this study. The other uh, trial I wanted to update you on is the CHALLENGE trial or the CO21 trial. And this was um, designed really as the first phase three trial to look at the effects of exercise on disease-free survival um, in any cancer survivor group. In this case, it was colon cancer. So in this trial, we're recruiting medically fit colon cancer patients, either high-risk stage two or stage three colon cancer. They've completed adjuvant chemotherapy within the past uh, two to six months. Baseline testing, various stratification factors, and they're randomized to a three-year exercise intervention. Uh, we, we know that you can improve um, many outcomes with short-term interventions. You can improve quality of life. You can improve aerobic fitness, muscular strength with 12 weeks intervention, sometimes even shorter. But when you talk about trying to alter the course of the disease, I'm not sure whether a, a brief 12-week uh, program would have an impact on long-term disease outcomes. So here we're trying to keep them exercising for a three-year period so we can look at 
any impact it will have on, on three-year disease-free survival. Uh, it has a bit of a supervised component to it early on. We see them every two weeks, and then later on we transition to once a month of supervised exercise as well as uh, substantial behavioral support um, intervention. The challenge, obviously, is, is keeping patients exercising for this three-year period. We did report uh, the one-year feasibility in terms of the behavior change in this trial, and at least that one year, we found some very nice results showing that the intervention group was doing substantially more physical activity than the health education group, and we even found differences in, in objective fitness measures as well. So uh, we're, we're comfortable that the intervention is working and, and separating the groups in terms of physical activity and fitness levels, and we're now in the process of trying to finish accrual. We've randomized over 525. Our goal is 962. So we still have a few more years of accrual. There is a uh, um, efficacy analysis built in, an interim efficacy analysis when we reach 125 events. And I think right now we have about 100 events in the trial. So we'll be doing this interim efficacy analysis probably sometime within the next six months. The last trial I'll share with you a uh, very exciting, very recent trial called the Interval or GAP-4 trial. And this is a trial being supported by the Movember Foundation, uh, a multinational trial uh, going to be run in 22 centers across eight countries. So um, it, a really important trial, I think. It's the first phase three randomized controlled trial looking at exercise and overall survival as the primary outcome. And it's going to be conducted in 866 prostate cancer patients with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer to see whether or not exercising, even at that stage of the disease, can actually improve overall survival. And it's powered for a hazard ratio of 0 0.78. Study co-chairs are Fred Saad, from, a urologist from the University of Montreal, and Rob Newton, who's an exercise scientist at Edith Cowan University. So here, uh, the men are going to be randomized either to the exercise program or to a, a usual care group plus psychosocial support. The exercise group will get a fairly intense exercise intervention. This was hotly debated on the steering committee, and I'm sure there's um, a pros and cons of taking this approach. But in the end, it was decided to go with a, a fairly um, intense supervised program, three times per week for the first month, twice per week for the next seven or eight months, and then once a week, uh, uh, for the remainder of that year. And then after one year, they transition to a home-based or unsupervised program where they come in for visits once a month. And the goal then is to keep them exercising for two years. Again, we felt this was an appropriate time length to try and improve uh, survival in this population where su median survival is around uh, two and a half to three years. Uh, the usual care group also gets a psychosocial support intervention and does the various exercise assessments. This trial is opened in Perth. That was the pilot center to try and work out any of the early challenges. They've screened about 60 patients over the year and have randomized 10 in the first year. Two other centers have opened for accrual, including our center in Edmonton. We have screened uh, a number of patients in the last month or two, and we have a number who have expressed interest in this study, so we're hopeful that we will start putting patients on this trial very shortly as well. And the goal is to have all of these centers activated and recruiting by the end of this year. So in summary, um, uh, as Pam said, for obesity, there's very good data that self-reported physical activity is associated with survival in several cancers. It's quite consistent for breast, colon, and prostate. The mechanistic data are also supportive of possible effects. I think a precision medicine approach may be very informative as we work through uh, which types of cancers exercise might be beneficial for. I mentioned there is the prospectively designed AMBER study looking at this issue in breast cancer and um, two phase three trials that are ongoing right now that will hopefully provide more definitive evidence of whether or not we can tell cancer patients if you adopt an exercise program after a diagnosis, you can in fact lower your risk for recurrence, and improve survival. Thank you for your time.